Hello, Chase Oaks. Good to see you guys. And uh, that's true whether you are here at our Legacy Campus or at 544 at Sloan Creek. Those of you online, uh, wherever you are, uh, some people all around the world, really glad that you are Chase Oakers, at least today. And uh, whether you've been here for a long time or this is your first time, if you want to be on this journey with us, you're in. If you want to be a Chase Oaker, you're a Chase Oaker. And we're glad you are. So uh, today on this journey, really it's about learning what it means to follow Jesus. And, and, and we're going to be looking at, at, in this series, what we've been doing is looking at Jesus from a unique perspective, and that is through the lens of some of the crazier things that Jesus did and, and, and said that, that make you go, wait a minute, like what? Did he just do that or did he just say that? And today we're going to see both uh, briefly a crazy action and then a crazy statement that is kind of crazy, but crazy good. They heard it as crazy bad. What he meant was actually crazy good. The statement that we're going to focus on, he's in the temple in Jerusalem, and he says, destroy this temple, and in three days, I will raise it up again. Now, again, they heard that as crazy bad. He meant it as crazy good because what he was talking about is the fact that he came to open up a whole new way to access God, like a, a, a crazy way to access God. And most of us, I think, have an understanding that we're not quite worthy to be right in God's presence, certainly once we understand what Jesus came to do, because it's way beyond whatever we're thinking, whatever we think we know of experience, it's way beyond that. Uh, kind of unworthy of that. Like, and, and it's always good to have access to things that are awesome. Like to be a, you know, it'd be great sometimes to be a celebrity and be able to go anywhere we want. Everybody rolls out the red carpet, glad we're there. But most of us aren't in that category. Most of us know what it's like to be on the outside looking in, wondering if we fit, wondering if we're worthy. And maybe then we can relate to these two guys that we're about to see on a, from a goofy, it's a movie clip from a, a goofy movie from the 90s, a SNL a spinoff. See if we can relate. My good hombre, remember us? No. Doug and Steve Butavi? Your brothers? No. Yes? yes? Man! It works every time. Yeah, I know. Now nah, remember, you can't come in. <laughs> What's up, buddy? How you doing tonight? It's time to play a little softball. <clears throat> Hey, good man. How's it going tonight? Good. You still can't come in. Well, that's not what a friend of mine told me. Maybe you know him. His name is Abraham. You don't know him. What about his two friends? George Washington and George Washington. Let's not forget the other boy in the band, George Washington. He's a little lonely, wants to join his buddies. And look who else we got. Uh, Roosevelt, Roosevelt, and Jefferson. Okay. Great. <laughs> and when you get down to Roosevelt, you're in trouble. Um, and, and, and really, when we're, what we're talking about, that's kind of all we got. We, we don't have much to, to commit ourselves to what we're talking about today. And yet, what Jesus came to bring is, is really crazy. Because what we're talking about is not access into some silly club, but access into the presence of God, into the throne room of God, the most precious, exclusive place in the, that exists. And, and for those who are not Christ followers yet, this is an opportunity to understand what Jesus came to do and how crazy it is, and to think, well, how close can I get to God? And we're going to see uh, really close. And for those of us, maybe we've been Christ followers for a while, and we think we get it. Oh, yeah, I kind of get where we're going here. No, we don't. We don't. Every one of us, me included, would, would relate to God very differently if we did. And so my prayer is that today God would open up our eyes, uh, just like in the song we sang a, a few minutes ago, that he would open our eyes to help us see this in a new way, in a fresh way. This is crazy good. So turn with me to John chapter 2 is where we're going to be. Uh, John chapter 2 is in the New Testament. It's actually the same chapter we were in, if you were here last week. So if you found it last week, you can find it this week. 
And you can look in the table of contents too for John. But we're talking about access to God. And as you're finding that, we need to, if we're going to understand what Jesus came to do differently, we have to understand where things started from. So we're going to give a little history lesson. I need you to stay with me during the history lesson. Can we do it? All right, good. So um, I'm going to give a history lesson about access to God. So it starts in the Garden of Eden when God creates humanity. Adam and Eve are in the Garden of Eden, and they have full access to God because they are sin-free. They are perfect. They are holy. God is perfect. He is holy. He is holy, cannot be around sin. They're fine because they don't have sin. So they have this perfect relationship in the Garden of Eden. Every, uh, every day they, he walks with them in the Garden of Eden, it says, and they have this perfect relationship. That changes, however, when Adam and Eve choose to disobey God, choose sin. Then, all of a sudden, they are sinful, unholy, and God is holy, and there's a gap. There's a major distance. No, now they have no more access to the presence of God like they had. And God could have just kept it that way with humanity, but he didn't. He wanted there to be connection. So he makes a way for us as humanity to be able to connect as unholy people to a holy God. He starts a process that matures into this, the temple system that we're going to talk about today, and Jesus came to do something new. But until Jesus came, this is the way it worked. This is how you and I would have access to God as human beings. And that is there was a sacred place. A lot of religions kind of work this way, by the way. But there was a sacred place. That's the temple where the story is today in Jerusalem. One geographic place on the planet. Everybody was expected who wanted to know God to make a pilgrimage. Once a year, you would go at least once a year to the temple. There were sacred priests there who were specialized people who had more access to God than the rest of us. And they had to do all this purification stuff even for that because they're unholy too, right? And and so they have to do all this stuff for them to be considered sacred. And they represented us to God. They did sacrifices as well. So you would, to cover over your sin, you would bring sacrifices and they would sacrifice all these animals and stuff and the priests would do that on on, on behalf of normal people. And so that your sin could be covered over and you could be forgiven and that kind of thing. But it was a very distant connection to God. And uh, so let me give one level deeper. You with me still? So the temple, when you came to the temple, there were three parts to the temple. The temple courts, which is where everybody could go. If you were a, an Old Testament believer, you could go into the temple courts, and you, people would pray there. They would worship God there. It's kind of like praying for a distance, praying for a like, can you hear me? You know, kind of a thing. Because the locus of God's presence, symbolically symbolizing the throne room in heaven, was deeper in. You couldn't go there. So next was the holy place. Only the priests could go into the holy place. That's where they did their sacrifices and prayed and had this incense and all this kind of stuff and uh, prayed on behalf of the people. But you weren't allowed as a normal person, just a priest could go in there. But then the most exclusive real estate on the planet was the Holy of Holies, the most holy place. And that was the symbolic location of God, symbolized his presence, the throne room of God. And only one person could ever go behind that curtain. There's a big, thick curtain between the holy place and most holy place, or holy of holies. Only one person could go there. That was the high priest, representing everybody else. And he could only do it once a year on the Day of Atonement. And when he did that, when he went into the presence of God, because he's unholy too, he had to do all these incredible like purification rituals and crazy stuff and dress a certain way and do certain things. And when he especially went behind that curtain and it was was really prescribed what he had to do, if he made one mistake, you know what would happen? He'd be, you know, he was dead. Like, you know, God would zap him down dead. The holiness of God, he'd just be. So what tradition tells us, history tells us, is they started to put uh, tie bells or sew bells around the bottom of his robe because one of the issues is, well, what if he messes up and falls down dead and we don't know? Like he's just in there forever, and you're like, what's wrong with him? You think he's okay? I don't know. Because if you went in to check, what would happen? He'd be knocked down dead. Only the high priest could go in. So they would tie a rope around his ankle and bells around his robe so that if he fell down dead, they'd hear the ding ling 
and they know, uh-oh, the dingling messed up, right? <laughs> and uh, you wouldn't go get him, so you'd pull him out, pull out the dingling. Be like, oh, well, we'll try again next year. <laughs> that was the kind of access we had. To, okay, that's, that's the way it was. That was the system. And what Jesus came to do was very different. Now, he comes into the temple in our story in John chapter 2, and what he sees absolutely makes him infuriated. And, you know, different things set off different people. Some of you, you know, things, different things set you off that are unique. But if you want to make God really mad, all you have to do is mess with access to him, to people he wants to connect with. Make that difficult. Take advantage of that. That'll really make him mad. And that's what happens in Jesus' case, who happens to be God, right? So he is in the temple, and what he sees just, just makes him go crazy. And he's about to do one of the craziest things he did, and that is clear the temple with the whip and all that. Maybe you've heard that story. And the reason he gets so upset is because the priests are taking advantage of the system to their benefit and making it really hard on people to connect to God. They're making themselves rich with this. So what they did is in the temple, in the temple courts, one of the areas was the court of the Gentiles. Gentiles are non-Jewish people. So this was the provision for people who were the nations. Israel was chosen by God to be a light to the nations, to help the nations know what it meant to connect to God. But they take the court of the Gentiles because they don't care about the nations at this point. They should, but they don't. And they're like, yeah, we don't, we're not going to let them in anyway. So they make a store in the court of the Gentiles. And the store is for the Jewish people to come and be able to buy their sacrifices, the animals, and do some other things too. The reason they buy sacrifices is because people were coming from all over the world. It was hard to bring your animal with you, and you can't get them on the plane very easily, and you know, whatever. And, uh, but, um, and also, the priests, and here's where they took advantage of people, the animals, like sheep or whatever, had to be, had to be pure and unblemished and, and like perfect. And so even if you brought your own animal, a lot of times a priest would say, yeah, sorry, eh, reject, that one's not. But I've got one right here that's certified pure, that's certified perfect and acceptable. It's expensive, but it's perfect. I mean, you know, you can not have your sins forgiven and go to the other place if you want, or here's this nice animal, right? You see, I mean, that's a lot of sway. And they became extremely wealthy because of that. The priest did. Not only that, they were making money off of money changing. Because people would bring in the Roman currency, you know, it was in the Roman system, they bring in Roman currency, and because they had pictures of Caesar on them, uh, the priest decided, well, that's kind of like idolatry, it's, it's images of other people, we need to make our own currency, like temple currency, like God currency, so for people to bring in their tithes and offerings to give to God, they had to go to the money changer to trade their Roman money for temple money, for a fee, right? And it just made Jesus go crazy. If you want to know what makes Jesus go postal, well, he goes postal. So he leaves. He, he takes some cords, leather cords, and makes a whip. This is not just an impulsive thing. You can picture him there as he's thinking about it, making this whip, weaving the whip. And then he comes back into the temple with that whip into the court of the Gentiles, and he, and he goes Indiana Jones on everybody. And he's in there going, whap, you know, and he's not just like threatening people, like he's like hitting people. And, and the, the priests and the other people in there and the money changers, and he's knocking over the tables and money's just going everywhere all over those stone floors. Animals are now stampeding through the temple. I mean, it's just craziness in there. And you can hear on the loudspeaker, you know, uh, uh, clean up on aisle two, clean up on aisle four. Manager to aisle three, you know, do all this kind of stuff. And so the leaders come out, the priests, to say, what in the world's going on? Who is this guy? And he's saying, you know, you're making my father's house, which is a house of prayer for the nations, into a den of thieves. And he's calling God his father, and he the son of God. And so they have this little conversation. John 2, 18, the Jews then responded to Jesus, what sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Who do you think you are? And you're calling God your father like you're the son of God, okay? Prove it. What miracle do you have to prove who you are, who you claim to be? And Jesus answered them, destroy this temple. You do that, and here's the sign, the miracle, and I will raise it again in three days. Destroy this temple. Now, they're in the physical temple, this huge structure. And I will raise it again in three days. Now, Nobody gets what he's saying. I mean, they're thinking very literally. 
And they replied, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you're going to raise it again in three days? And it really did take 46 years. The temple was one of the most, arch- one, one, one of the most impressive architectural feats of the Roman era. It, it, incredibly impressive. Huge building with these, made with just these massive stones. Everybody's like, how did they, with their technology, possibly could have done this? And they did it. It took 46 years to do it. And they're saying, okay, so it takes, took us 46 years, and you're going to raise it again in three days. Now, there's a deeper meaning, of course, and John knows that. He has the advantage of hindsight. But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, how many days? Three days, right? His disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture in the words that Jesus had spoken. So the statement, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up again. What in the world did Jesus mean by that? And we need to understand it if we're going to understand the access that we have to God. So let's, let's dig deeper a little bit. What did he mean? Because there are levels of meaning here, two different levels of meaning, which was typical in rabbinical preaching. Jesus was a rabbi. They would speak in multiple layers of meaning. So when he said destroy this temple, a couple layers of meaning. On the surface, he was talking about the temple, the physical temple. Because essentially what he's saying is you are destroying the temple. You, the priests and religious leaders who are taking advantage of people, making yourselves wealthy, and wealthy, making it really difficult for them to connect to me, you're desecrating this place with your evil and your hypocrisy. And you are opening up this otherwise sacred place to the judgment of God. And one day God will come and he will put a stop to this. He will judge it. And he would. Like in 40 years later, in 70 AD, the Jews rebel. The Romans come in to quash the rebellion. And they destroy what was considered indestructible. They destroy the temple. I mean, just take it apart down to the foundations. So on one level, he was talking about that. But on a deeper level, as John tells us, he was talking about the temple of his body. Because Jesus is God who took on humanity. He's God in a bod. And that body is the temple of God because God is resident in that temple. And so he's talking about the crucifixion when they, the Jewish leader, the religious leaders, um, crucify him. And of course, that would happen as this. In three days, I will raise it up. Two different levels of meaning. On one level, it's, he's talking about the resurrection. You destroy my body, you put my body in the ground, in three days I will raise it up. And he talked about the, his death and resurrection a lot because Jesus came to die, to be a, the final sacrifice for sin, to make it possible for us to have access to God we're talking about today. And one of those passages, John 10, he said, I sacrifice my life so I may take it back again. No one could take my life from me. I sacrifice it voluntarily. For I have the authority to lay it down when I want to and also to take it up again, for this is what my Father has commanded. So on that level, he's talking about his body, to die and be raised again. But again, on a deeper level, he was talking about something else that he came to do. If the temple system that he came, you put to death the temple, the temple system, and he was going to make, raise up a whole new way, a whole new place a whole new opportunity for us to connect with God. The temple system we talked about before, that he was replacing that. He came here to do what God had promised he would do, and that is make a new deal, a new way to access him. In John chapter four, he talks about that with the woman at the well. He says, believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. It's not, the sacred place is no more. The time is coming, indeed it's here now, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Meaning God, we won't have to go somewhere, God will be resonant in us, in those who believe. A whole new kind of access. In Ephesians 3 it says, because of Christ and our faith in him, we can now come boldly and confidently into God's presence. Here's what Jesus came to do. And we're going to look at a passage that will take this even deeper. You still with me? All right, just say yes. So, uh, um, When he died on the cross, he died to take away our sin, to make it possible for us to be purified from our sin so that we would be declared righteous and holy, even though we're still in process. And therefore, since he died to make us holy in God's eyes, we can therefore boldly and confidently enter into God's presence. We don't have to be sheepish. 
wondering if we belong there. And I know a lot of people feel sheepish. You feel like, hey, man, I'm, I'm unworthy to be there. And you know why? Because you are. And so am I. But it's God's grace that makes it possible for us. And that means that I don't, like, people will call me sometimes and say, which I love praying for people, that's no problem, and, and you know, that's a thing, that's good. But people say, hey, Jeff, you know, look, I don't think I have much cloud up there in heaven. And um, so can you, like, pray, because you got that hotline to God, you're a pastor, and because and, I really need God to do me a solid on this one, and, like, you know, I really need this sale, or I really need this to happen with my wife's, you know, operation. Would you? And, of course, I pray, and, and there's a role of a leader to pray, and that's all good. But what Jesus came to do is make it possible for all of us to have the same access to God, because it's not about us, it's about his work on our behalf. So again, the system, because we're going to see how this is dismantled. Sacred place, sacred priest, sacrifices. Remember that? Let's take it deeper, Hebrews 10. Under the old covenant, that's the old deal that God made with people. Sacred priest, sacred place. That's, that's, here's how you can access me. It's very imperfect. It's very different, distant, but there's connection. The priest stands and ministers before the altar day after day, offering the same sacrifices again and again, which can never take away sins. It just covered them over. But our high priest, Jesus, offered himself to God as a single sacrifice for sin, the final sacrifice, good for all time. Then he sat down in the place of honor at God's right hand. There he waits until his enemies are humbled and made a footstool under his feet. That's talking about when Jesus returns to this earth and, and, uh, and brings judgment and makes a new heaven and a new earth. In the meantime, he's there by the heavenly Father. For by that one offering, he forever made perfect those who are being made holy. Who's he talking about here? Anybody who's come to believe in Jesus. Anybody who's decided to be a Christ follower. But the wording is kind of weird. So if you become a Christ follower, here's what it's saying about you that you have been forever made perfect and you're being made perfect at the same time. Like, you're already holy and he's making you holy. Like, well, which is it? Like, either I am holy or I'm being made holy. And the answer is both are true. That because of the work of Jesus Christ, positionally, you and I have been declared by God holy, certified pure because of the blood of Jesus that we trade our sin for his righteousness, and therefore, in God's eyes, you and I are as holy as Jesus is. However, in practicality and reality, we're not anywhere close, right? I mean, some of you are like, yeah, if you knew where I was last night, you'd be like, yeah, yeah, I, you know, I'm not. and I get that, right? So we're all, none of us, are, we're all in the same boat on this. So he's making us holy, he's transforming our life, but he's declared us holy. So we are holy and we're being made holy at the same time. And the Holy Spirit also testifies that this is so. For he says, this is the new covenant. There's a new deal. And it's a good one. Crazy good. I will make with my people on that day, says the Lord. I will put, now this is an Old Testament passage, an Old Testament prophecy. I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. This is the hope that God was offering humanity. It wasn't just the hope of heaven after we die. Think, oh yeah, that's the big hope. That's not it. The new deal is, I'm going to give you a whole new way to access God that starts now. You have to wait till heaven to be able to go into the throne room of God and be in his presence, to be connected with God. It's a new deal now, a crazy one. And he says, I will never again remember their sins and lawless deeds. And when sins have been forgiven, there's no need to offer any more sacrifices. That's done. So Jesus came to offer a new deal. No more sacred place, a temple that we have to go to. Why? Because once we begin a relationship with Jesus, the Bible says that our bodies are the temple of the Spirit, just like Jesus' was. We're the temple of God. God is closer than close. We don't have to go somewhere. He's here. Not only that, the Bible says that we corporately, as the gathering, as his church or the temple of God, that there's a sense in which we experience God's presence alone, that we, that, which is cool, and a sense in which we experience God's presence in a different way when we gather together, and this church is also the temple of God. Not the building, whatever building we're, you're in right now, but the people, look around, the gathering. This is the temple of God. God indwells us corporately. And that's one of the reasons why this discipline of gathering is important because we, we experience God's presence. We hear from him in a unique way. We're able to minister 
in his presence and, and worship him in a unique way when we gather. And you guys are doing that discipline right now because you showed up. You're here, so pat yourself on the back. You did good. Really. I mean, it's important. Sacred priests, no more sacred priests, no more intermediary. The Bible says there is one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. He's our high priest. And the Bible even says that all of us have become priests ourselves. You may not feel like it, but you are. That we, we've become believer priests. We can enter into God's presence anytime. We don't have to go, you know, hey, somebody, you know, call, call for me or use that hotline. We all have the hotline to God. And sacrifices are no more. That's over. Because of that, that new deal, which is a crazy deal. I mean, all of that would have been considered like blasphemy in the Old Testament, that God would do this. Listen to what he continues. And so, dear brothers and sisters, that's anybody who knows Jesus, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place. Remember the most holy place from our history lesson, the Holy of Holies? Only one person once a year could go and had to have the dingling bells. We can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus, meaning you don't need any bells, you don't need rope around you, you can go confidently and boldly right into the throne room of God, and there's no bouncer that's going to keep you out because of the blood of Jesus, because of what he's done for us. We have full access. By his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain. Remember the curtain? that separated the holy place from the holy. Uh, The Bible says that when Jesus died, that literal curtain in the temple was torn in half, showing that God was saying, hey, you know what? No more curtain. Now, through Jesus, we can go right into the holy of holies through that curtain. And since we have a great high priest, Jesus, who rules over God's house, again, he's saying, let us go right in the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him, meaning if we have this opportunity, let's go, let's do it. For our guilty consciences, anybody have a guilty conscience? You should, because we're guilty. (laughs) Have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean, and our bodies have been washed with pure water. So he's saying, so since God has done this, what he's done is unthinkable. I mean, really, if you would try to explain this to to somebody 2,500 years ago who's a faithful Israelite before Jesus came, they would probably throw stones at you and kill you. That God would open up the opportunity that he's opened up for regular people like us, once we know Jesus, to say, yeah, we can come into God's presence anytime. It is so crazy. That's why I think none of us, I know I don't, we don't, it's just hard to get this. So to help us a little bit, I'm going to use an illustration, which I happen to think is the best kind of illustration for a sermon, and that's a college football illustration, okay? (laughs) Not only that, you ready for this? Ah, an Alabama football illustration. Now, hey, I'm all for your team too. I really am. You've got your team, and I'm, I'm glad you do, and that's part of the fun, and I'm excited for you. I hope you do great. Not that great, but great. And, uh, um, but since I've got the microphone, you know, and I'm an Alabama guy, uh, that's one of the perks. So, um, so this goes all the way back to the 2012-2013 football season, this illustration, okay? And it's going to go to me going to a game here in Dallas. So in the 2012-2013 season, um, just to give a little Alabama football history lesson, we've done the Access to God history lesson. Let's do 2012-20. So they've just come off a national championship year, which is, yay, okay, good, some of y'all, boo. And, um, and they start the season here in Dallas. This is where the illustration's gonna make a little bit more sense. Um, at Jerry World, you know, at Jerry Jones's house, at, uh, at, Cow- at Cowboys Stadium. And just to refresh your memory, that was Advocare uh, kickoff classic against um, Michigan, and it, it, it was a good game. Alabama won 41 to 14. So, but I know, go Michigan. But I know that some are thinking, well, that's how the season started. But Jeff, tell us how it ended. Don't keep us in suspense, right? And it ended at the national championship game against Notre Dame, and we won 42 to 14. So it was a good year. Are you ready for that to be over? All right. Well, we'll so here's, here's the deal. Here's why we're saying all this. So the first game, I got to go to it. That's it. And it was here in Dallas at Jerry World at Cowboys Stadium. But we didn't just get to go to the game. Through a connection here at Chase Oaks, we were given access to the owner's suite at Cowboys Stadium, which was really cool. And my family flew out, my parents, my brother, and one of his sons, and you know, our family, and, and, uh, 
And we were given as part of that, that's why you got these black armbands when you came in. Everybody get one? We were given the black armband. Now, the black armband, we learned, was the key to everything, and it was awesome being in that stadium with a black armband associated with the owner's suite because you know what that meant? It meant we had access to anything. So we, you know, drive up to park. Where do we park with the black armband? Underneath the stadium where the players park. So we, uh, we drive up, and there's all these barricades and people, and they're like, who's this dude? We've never seen these people. Black armband? And we also happen to use the fact that our last name just happens to be Jones, you know? <laughs> and uh, so, we had, so we used it. So we're like, oh, yeah, owner suite, we're Joneses. Because we are Joneses. Um, we don't know Jerry, but still, we are Joneses. So we, you know, they, they escort us in. They valet park our car. We go to the elevator, which is just for those in the owner suite. The, the people are there, the security, and... Black armband, we're Joneses. Oh, and uh, so they said, where would you like to go? I'm like, where can we go? I said, well, with that armband, you can go just about anywhere you want. How about on the field? Because we were there pretty early. How about, can we go on the field? Everybody was warming up and all that. Yeah, with that black armband. So we go up to field level. We go out toward the uh, field. The security comes up, uh, excuse us, you know, and, and black armband, we're Joneses. Okay, so we go on to the field. In fact, here we are. Uh, this is some of my family. Uh, that's my dad uh, next to me there. With, um, with the, well, of course, we all have red shirts on. And my mom, uh, my brother there on the end. And thank you. A lot of you are praying for my dad, um, who uh, is uh, uh, fighting through Lou Gehrig's disease and ALS. And um, so thank you for your prayers for him. And then uh, on the right is my youngest son, Caleb, with a goofy look, and he won't be happy that I used that picture. But that's, uh, anyway, we're, it was really cool to be down there. And then, of course, we went up to the owner's suite. That wasn't so bad either. I mean, we had everything we could possibly want up there. And it was a great place to watch a game. And, and then we decided after the game, well, what do we want to do now? Well, let's go down and see uh, Saban's press conference. Why? Because we can. So we go down, security, black armband, we're Joneses. And then we uh, went to the area. My nephew the, was in the band, and hey, let's, uh, let's find them before they get and fly out. And uh, so we uh, meet up with him and talk with him down there, and then we, we were ready. We left our little perfect environment we had going. The black armband was awesome. Jesus came and died and rose from the dead to make it possible to give you and me the black armband. Full access not just into Jerry world, but full access into the presence of God, into the throne room of God. Anytime we want, full access. But it's better than that because he also made us Joneses. Better than Joneses. He made us his children. The Bible says that when we begin a relationship with Jesus, that he adopts us into his family and we become his sons and daughters. And therefore, for us, he's not only God, he's our Father. In fact, Jesus said, and this was one of those wait, what moments of Jesus when he's talking about prayer and he's teaching to the crowds and somebody says, hey, teach us how to pray. And he says, if you follow me, when you pray, start out this way, Abba, Father, which would have been crazy because Abba was their word for like daddy. He's like, hey, if you know, if you, you know, through me, if you follow me, then when you pray, start out by saying, Daddy. Because to us, he's not only the sovereign of the universe, worthy of all respect, which he is, but he's also our daddy who longs for us to come into his presence because he loves his children. And we can crawl right up into the arms of our father who delights in us. When I was in high school, this is where paying attention in history can sometimes help in school. I remember seeing an image I'm about to show you, and I was a Christ follower in high school, but this for me kind of cemented what we're talking about in my mind. It changed the way I think about prayer. And here's the picture. It's of JFK as president in the White House, in the Oval Office, and below him, John Jr., his son, playing with his toys. Because for John Jr., was he the president of the most powerful man in the world? Yeah. That everybody wants to get time with? Yeah. In the most you know, exclusive office in the world? Yeah. But for him, he was also my dad. Or a Caroline. 
having a tea party with her dad. Because is he the most powerful man in the world and hot shot and all? Yeah. But to her, who is he? That's my daddy. And to him, who is she? That's my girl. And when you and I come into God's presence, I know we're not worthy. We're not. But the Bible says, because of the blood of Jesus, we don't have to be sheepish. We can be confident because we're coming into the lap of our daddy who loves us, who wants us, longs for us to be in his presence. When he sees you, he's not holding his nose going, oh, no. Them again? If you know Jesus Christ, you're his son, you're his daughter that he deeply loves. And that's why with this armband this week, serve as a reminder You can put it on or you can put it somewhere else just to remind you this week, especially if you feel sheepish in God's presence, like, oh, I don't belong there. or Man, I'm really a screw up or I, whatever. If you have a relationship with Jesus, you got the armband. And remember, hey, look, you're forgiven and you've been declared righteous and holy. And yet God's working on you and he's transforming you. But here's, you know what you'll find when you go into God's presence? The Bible tells us, we don't have to guess. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his what? And not a spanking, his mercy. And we'll find grace to help us when we need it most. All you will find once you have a relationship with God in the presence of God, the Bible says there's no condemnation anymore. All you'll ever find is mercy and grace when you come to God. Satan will convince you you need to run away. God's mad, he's angry, you better run away. And what Jesus is saying, no, because of the blood of Jesus, you go to the throne and find mercy and grace to help us get back on track. For others of us, it may be that this this would be a reminder, if we ever find ourselves getting apathetic, which is easy to do once you've been a Christ follower for a while. So yeah, I know that, you know, we have access to God, we can pray, we can go into God's presence. I get that, I know that. We don't get it. I don't know anybody who does, because if we really understood the privilege we have, we would relate to God way differently than we do. And so let's take advantage of it. Spend time in God's presence, hearing from him in his word, the Bible, praying to him, be, walking with him, just doing life with him, and just realizing I, 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 I can live in his presence as I work, as I live, as I, and, because we've got the armband. Let's bow our heads together in prayer. And when we come in prayer, we come as a corporate entity, as a gathering, his church, literally into the throne room of God. Picture that. Picture the throne room of God. All the angels around. God the Father on the throne. Jesus at his right hand. And for some, you may think, I don't think I have access to that. And maybe because you don't. Because on our own, in our sin, we're separated from God. But that's why Jesus came, to make it possible for the guilt of our sin to be removed. And the Bible says that, that what we deserve is separation from God, but what he offers as a gift is life with him, access to God fully. So this might be the time you choose to say, God, I, I choose to believe. I choose to receive what you offer as a gift for you not only to forgive me, but to make it possible for me to be declared holy, even as you're making me perfect. I, I know I'm not, but you declare that because of the blood of Jesus, cleansing me, making me clean, so that I can be, I can have a relationship with you, be in your presence. God, I, I'm in on that. If that's the new covenant, the new deal, if you're willing to make, I'm in. I give you me and ask you to come into my life. Help me follow you. That's what it means to know God. And for others, maybe you've known God for a while, but Satan or just your own conscience has you spinning away from God because of your failure and sin. And this is an opportunity to say, God, this is crazy what we're talking about because I don't deserve you. I I don't. I've been just trying to clean up my life so I can maybe sneak in, but you're saying I can come right up into your lap because you're my daddy and you love me and all you have for me is mercy and grace. And so God, I'm gonna run up there. Run past all those angels. I'm just gonna run up there in your lap because I can and you delight in it. And for others, it's an opportunity to say, oh God, don't don't let me be apathetic about this one. This is way too good for that. Father, we do thank you and we praise you. You're, You're 
when the Bible says you're good, we don't even begin to understand what that means. You're so much better than we can comprehend. And what you did is so much bigger than we can comprehend. And, and just help us understand a little bit more about this new covenant and about the access that you and I can have or that we can have before you. In Jesus' name, we thank you. Amen.